Hello again, this is Peter Gade with the USMLE RX Express team, and in this lecture in immunology we'll be talking about the immunosuppressants. Pharmacologically, there are three ways to inhibit an unwanted immune response. The first is by giving anti-inflammatory drugs. A potent drug class in this category are the variety of steroids available for clinical use. For example, prednisone. Within this category are also the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or NSAIDs. For example, aspirin and ibuprofen. This category of drugs is discussed elsewhere, and we won't consider them further here. The second pharmacologic class that we have at our disposal includes a set of drugs which are known as cytotoxic. As their name implies, the cytotoxic drugs prevent cell division. Because the proliferation of lymphocytes is key to an adaptive immune response, the cytotoxic drugs can be used to inhibit unwanted immune responses. But as we'll discuss, these drugs are potent inhibitors of cell division and therefore affect many other cell-dividing populations, and not just immune cells. The third category is the main focus of this talk, and is known as the immunosuppressive drugs. Again, as we'll discuss, these drugs are more specific to the cells of the immune system, but inhibit both good and bad immune responses, which can of course result in some very serious side effects. As you'll see, the cytotoxic and immunosuppressive drugs that we'll be discussing are used for two main purposes here, in the prevention of transplant rejection and for the treatment of autoimmune disease. As we go through this lecture, I'll point out whether the drug is known as a cytotoxic drug or an immunosuppressive drug, which will help you remember some features about these unique drug classes. First, we'll discuss the three key immunosuppressants. We'll then consider one key cytotoxic drug, and finally conclude with a discussion about how antibodies can actually be used to modulate the immune system. The thing to realize is that while all these drugs serve to inhibit unwanted immune responses, they suppress the immune system in general, and leave patients susceptible to serious infections. However, this is a risk that's accepted because of the necessity of a transplant, or because of the severity of an autoimmune disease. The three immunosuppressants that we'll discuss are cyclosporin, tacrolimus, and serolimus, which is better known as rapamycin. The thing to mention here is that although tacrolimus and serolimus have similar sounding names, tacrolimus and cyclosporin are actually more similar in their mechanism of action. We'll come to these other two immunosuppressants in a moment, but first let's discuss cyclosporin. Both tacrolimus and cyclosporin bind to a family of proteins which are known as the cyclophilins. When these drugs bind to the cyclophilins, they inhibit a key molecule known as calcineurin, which is a part of the intracellular T-cell signaling pathway. When calcineurin is inhibited, a T-cell can no longer become activated, and among many other effects, the production of IL-2 and its receptor is prevented. As we learned, T-cells are responsible for acute and chronic rejection of transplants and thus cyclosporin and tacrolimus are used clinically to suppress organ rejection, and they also can be used in select autoimmune disorders. But as we discussed, the suppression of the immune system predisposes patients to viral infections and also to the development of lymphoma. In addition, this drug is toxic to the kidneys. Okay, let's move on to tacrolimus. Tacrolimus is very similar to cyclosporin, Specifically, tacrolimus binds to a cyclophilin that is known as FK binding protein. Again, when it binds to this protein, this complex goes on to inhibit calcineurin and has the same effects as cyclosporin. It also has very similar toxicities. Note again the toxicity to the kidney. The third and final immunosuppressant we'll consider is serolimus, otherwise known as rapamycin. Notice that it has very similar effects to the other immunosuppressants we just talked about. It inhibits T-cell activation and proliferation. The only difference is that instead of binding to a cyclophilin, rapamycin binds to a protein which is known as mTOR, and it is through this protein that it exerts its effects. mTOR, by the way, creatively stands for mammalian target of rapamycin. Because this protein was discovered only after rapamycin was being put to use. The final thing that I'll mention here is that all three of our immunosuppressants serolimus or rapamycin, tacrolimus, and cyclosporin are in fact products which are produced by certain bacteria and funguses. And hopefully this will help you remember that these three drugs are related and that they're all immunosuppressants.
Azathioprine is the one cytotoxic drug that we'll talk about here. Another important cytotoxic drug is cyclophosphamide, which you might have learned about elsewhere. Cytotoxic drugs interfere with DNA synthesis and hence have their greatest effect on cells which are continuously dividing. Three notable tissues of the body which are continuously dividing and which explain the toxicity of these drugs are the cells of the skin, which would include the cells of the hair follicle, thereby explaining the hair loss, which is often a feature of these drugs, the gut, which can explain the severe diarrhea, and finally the bone marrow, which inhibits the unwanted immune response, but of course affects the immune system in general, resulting in immunocompromise. Can you think of a fourth rapidly dividing tissue which these drugs could affect? If you're thinking of the fetus, you're absolutely right. The fetus, of course, begins as a ball of rapidly dividing cells, and hence any woman who's about to be started on a cytotoxic drug requires a pregnancy test. Specifically, azathioprine inhibits the de novo production of the purines adenine and guanine, and therefore prevents the proliferation of lymphocytes. For this reason, it can be used to prevent rejection and also in the treatment of some autoimmune disorders. But as we discussed, a serious toxicity is overall bone marrow suppression. Moreover, because of its target in the purine synthetic pathway, the toxic effects of azathioprine can be made worse by allopurinol. Finally, we'll talk about two monoclonal antibodies that are used in the clinic. Monoclonal antibodies, as well as recombinant cytokines and cytokine receptors, actually belong to a group of pharmacologics which are known as the biologics, and their use in patients is known as biological therapy. And this is because, in contrast to drugs, which are produced synthetically by chemists, for example, or those which are derived from bacteria, such as the antibiotics, these are a class of molecules which are found in normal mammalian biology, or which were produced with the use of mammals. The first of the two monoclonal antibodies that we'll consider is known as muromanab, or OKT3. Its trade name is also known as orthoclone. Of course, brand names are not used on the step one, but I mention this because it might be familiar. We talked about this monoclonal antibody before. It actually binds to and inhibits the function of the CD3 protein complex, which, as you'll remember, is the complex of proteins which is actually responsible for transmitting an intracellular signal when the T cell receptor has bound to its cognate antigen. Thus, when CD3 is blocked, no signal can be transduced and T-cell activation does not occur. Clinically, OKT3 can be used to prevent rejection of a kidney transplant. Note that its toxic effects include the cytokine release syndrome as well as hypersensitivity reactions. This is because although OKT3 ultimately blocks the function of CD3, when it first binds to CD3, it can actually trigger an intracellular signal and result in the inappropriate release of cytokines from T-cells. With careful dosing, however, this risk can be minimized. The second monoclonal antibody we'll mention is daclizumab. This antibody is specific to the IL-2 receptor and is used to block the receptor so that it can no longer bind IL-2 and thus prevent further activation of T cells. Finally, let's briefly mention some other biologics. On this slide, we've listed some recombinant cytokines and some of their uses in the clinic. Notice at this point, we're not specifically talking about preventing transplant rejection or treating particular autoimmune diseases. This is just a list of other biologics that you might find useful. Similarly, on this slide, we've listed a few antibodies which are used therapeutically, including the two that we already talked about, their particular target, and also their particular clinical use. And that's it for this section on the cytotoxic and immunosuppressant drugs.